Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our Self-Pip Live series. Are you wondering how to move up from a level eight to a level nine? Or are you already at level nine and are looking to aim higher? <clears throat> what does a level 12 response look like? Let's find out today. If we're meeting for the first time today, hi, I'm Ashruti, the host of Self-Up Live, and we go live every Tuesday and Friday at 9.30 a.m. PST. So if you haven't already, please subscribe to our channel and give this video a thumbs up if you find it useful. Um, for news updates, please wait till the end of this video. But for now, we're going straight to our main segment, uh, speaking section, response analysis. As always, Brandy is here with her exceptional presentations and to give us information about a speaking response analysis. But before that, if you have any questions, please ask them in the comments below and I will make sure that Brandy gets them. Hi, Brandy, how are you doing? Hi, Ashwadi, I am very well, thank you. It's nice to be back here on our Tuesday morning here in rainy Vancouver. <laughs> yes, yes, it is really rainy. I was awakened by crows today morning, so I, I understand the rain. But anyway, uh, we have quite a few people here, so I'm going to let you start your presentation. Excellent. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen here. So give me a moment to do that. There we go. Okay. All right, we are all set. So today we're going to do some more speaking response analysis, but I'm going to focus specifically on levels nine and level 12. We haven't yet talked about level 12, and I know a lot of our test takers are very uh, anxious to see what one looks like. So let's get into that today. Um, so as always, I'm just going to take the first few minutes today to run down the performance standards for your speaking test. So for anybody taking our self pit test soon, there are four different different criteria or dimensions that the raters are going to listen for as they, um, as they listen into your response. So the first one is about content and coherence. So when you're speaking, we really want to make sure you're giving uh, several main ideas, so at least two or three, I'd say. And the quality of your ideas is very important to anchor your response. So the more specific examples you can give and the more uh, details provided, it's going to really enhance this, this quality. All right, we also want the details to be organized in a very logical sequence. So we'll look at how that's done today when we get into our, our two sample responses. Your use of vocabulary also is very important. We, we want a sophisticated word choice if you can, but we want to make sure that all of your words are suitable for the question you're being asked. So uh, make sure that, again, the words uh, are there for a reason, right? They're tied into the question that you're answering and they're used accurately and precisely. Now, we don't want to just repeat the same words all the way through our response. So the more variety you can show as you go, the better it's going to be. Your listenability for speaking is really important. Your listenability is, is your speech delivery. So if you're pronouncing your words properly, of course, this is key because the raters need to understand what it is you're saying. And then we look at things like your rhythm. So do you have a very fluent um, musicality to your language? Is your voice rising and falling where it should be? All right, this helps the, the listener to follow and understand when one main idea is beginning and finishing and the next idea is starting again. Um, as we speak, we, we want to try to get through the beginning all the way to the end with minimal pauses and interjections. So try to avoid long pauses or hesitations and try not to interject too much. So sometimes when we don't have the word, uh, we make these sounds in English like um and g. We try not to do that to the best of our ability because as you imagine, if you do it too often, it's going to distract the listener from what you're saying. So again, minimal pauses, minimal interjections, um, try not to stop and start. So we don't want to just keep correcting ourselves and, and going back to the beginning, right? We want a fluent response all the way through. Now, as you're speaking, it's also important to speak in complete sentences and to try to vary your sentence structure. 
So uh, we don't want just short, simple sentences. We're hoping that we can also include some complex sentences. And again, I'll point out some examples of these as we look at our two responses today. The last thing that the readers are listening for is your task fulfillment. So how completely you answer the question and how relevant your details are, are really important here. Um, your tone is important too. So we want to always use you know, respectful language as we speak and make sure our tone of voice is conveying the correct emotion as well. But your length is really important. So if you're asked to speak for one minute on the test, then you want your response to be pretty close to that one minute. Um, if you're cut off at the, you know, the middle of your final sentence, it's really not a problem. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it should be close. Uh, you know, you would never want to finish your response with 20 seconds left over, for example. That's too short. So do practice at home to speak for either the full minute or the 90 seconds, as different questions on the CELPIP test will require uh, one of those two time lengths. Now, all four of these dimensions are evaluated to give you a score for each response you give. So it's important to practice all of them, right? We can't just practice our delivery skills and work on pronunciation and expect to move up an entire level. We really need to uh, learn how to present really detailed uh, ideas as well as organize them and try to boost the quality of our vocabulary as well, right? And answer the question fully. So all four of these dimensions work together. I think of them as sort of a package deal. Uh, we're not going to get a great score based on one dimension. It's a combination of all, all four skill sets. All right, and that's important to note as you move into your, your cell pip test. Um, now the cell pip is graded on uh, a scale with different levels. So the lowest score that anybody might achieve would be an M and that stands for a minimal proficiency. So it's beginning level English. The highest score anybody could get is a 12. And that shows advanced proficiency. So today we are going to look at a level nine and a level 12. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to see some very obvious differences in the levels there as we analyze today. So speakers who are achieving a level nine on, on their individual responses are showing effective proficiency. So if you get a level nine, you still have a very strong response, but the level 12 shows advanced proficiency. And we're going to start with the level 12 today. So you'll, you'll have a pretty good idea of what's expected, I hope. So when you take your speaking test, if you do achieve a level 12, you're going to receive this exact write-up on your score report. We call this a performance profile. And what this performance profile gives you is sort of a general overview of the main skills that a level 12 speaker can achieve. So I'll just read from the screen if you'd like to follow. Uh, a level 12 speaker says, I can precisely communicate complex details and ideas in formal and informal contexts to peers or authority figures in demanding non-routine situations. I have excellent control of complex grammar and can accurately use a very broad range of precise and context-specific vocabulary and idioms. I can adjust the tone and style of my speech to suit a broad range of situations. So we're, we're just about to listen to a sample response that more or less follows these performance profile standards. All right. We're focusing our attention today on task three of the cell PIP test. So remember, there are eight different tasks to complete. Again, task three is our attention today. And in task three, you're always going to be asked to describe a scene. So you'll be given uh, an image like you see here, a picture, and uh, you're going to be asked to describe it. So the instructions were on the test read, describe some things that are happening in the picture as well as you can. The person with whom you are speaking cannot see the picture. So again, we're starting with our level 12 response. And what I'd like you to do as you listen to this response is look at the image that was presented on this test. Remember, this was a real cell pip test question from the past, and this is a real test taker. And we're going to listen to his response to try to evaluate the strengths over all four of those dimensions. All right, now remember, I cannot see any of your questions or comments right now in our live stream, but please do post your questions as you listen. And at the end of our analysis today, I will go back and answer them. Okay, let's take a listen now and, and see how our first test taker does. So we're looking at a scene that's uh, either a country fair or at a circus. 
So there's some red and blue bunting, uh, there's some pink and yellow bunting, and another layer of bunting that's cyan or turquoise green and a very dark red or purple. Um, at the foreground of the picture we have three different uh, food stalls. We have uh, a kebab town, uh, a place called the curry bowl, and the third one looks to be a, a smoothie outfit. We can also see that there a child has unfortunately dropped her kebab. She seems very upset because there's a dog straining at a leash that looks like he's about to get a tasty kebab. The owner's dog is wearing a pair of green shorts and a blue t-shirt. He does not look impressed. His girlfriend appears to be carrying a map and does seems to be oblivious to the dog's uh, snack. Uh, there also seems to be a pair of senior citizens enjoying their day out. Ability. And you may have noticed that this speaker is a native language speaker. English is his first language, so he has the added benefit, you might say, of having a fairly natural rhythm and fluency to his, his delivery speech. His pronunciation was clear. His intonation, I think, was fine as well. It was rising and falling, and there was some energy and enthusiasm in the response as well. There were, of course, a few pauses and maybe a few interjections, and that's normal for any speaker, regardless of, of your level and regardless of your if it's your first language or not. But overall, his listenability, of course, was quite high. Let's take a look at his content next. So when you're asked to describe a scene in task three, it's really important to introduce in your opening an overview of what you're looking at. Remember, this task is asking you to describe this as if somebody else cannot see the picture. So you really want to organize that response to give the listener an opportunity to do just that. So our test taker here introduces the scene as a country fair or a circus, so that's great. It gives us something to hold on to as we're listening. And then he works his way through his response to identify several people and objects that he sees in the scene. So these are the orange bolded words that you see before you. So I'll just read them out if you can follow, please. We've got bunting. Uh, bunting, by the way, is a British term. It uh, refers to the, the strings of flags that are on top of the, the fair scene. So he starts with bunting. He gets into the food stalls and you notice he's identified them by name. So kebab town, curry bowl. And the third one he calls a smoothie outfit, which is a very natural expression to describe a food stand. All right, we know that we have kebabs for sale. He introduces a dog, an owner, gets the girlfriend in there, talks about what she's carrying, which is a map and a snack, and later on some senior citizens. So we, we won't have time to describe every single object in the scene, but our test taker certainly gets a lot of people and a lot of objects into the scene within his 60 seconds. So he's off to a very good start here with his content. The next thing this test taker does very well is for each person he's introduced, he describes the action that's happening. And this is something you'll want to work on for your responses. We want really strong action verbs if you can. It makes the scene much more descriptive and interesting. So you'll see the, the black underlined phrases represent these, uh, these actions. So first the child, we know that the child has unfortunately dropped the kebab. The dog is straining at the leash. The owner is wearing, we get a description of his clothing. The girlfriend is carrying a map and the senior citizens are enjoying their day out, All right? So lots of action packed in there. Before I move forward, I wanted to point out one little mistake that our test taker made here. I'm not sure if you notice, but I'm looking at where he's talking about the owner and I'll maybe pull out my little uh, laser pointer to draw your attention. Now we know it's the owner that is wearing the green shorts and blue t-shirt. But when this speaker spoke, he said the owner's dog is wearing a pair of green shorts. Did you catch that? It's a comical error. Clearly we understand that it's the owner. I think what happened is our speaker reversed these words. He meant to say the dog's owner is wearing. And I point that out to show you that we're not looking for perfection on any self of response. Even with little tiny mistakes like this, as you can see, it's still very uh, possible to achieve that level 12. We knew what he meant and it did not hurt the overall understanding of his response. It is kind of a funny image though. <laughs> All right, let's keep going with our content then. 
Another thing that our test taker does exceptionally well, which is partly why he's earned a level 12, is that not only do we get a description of the people and their actions, we also get some very strong descriptive language. So again, in orange, you see some of these uh, people or objects we've already looked at. And in blue, we get the descriptive language in the phrase of either uh, colors or sometimes even emotions. And this is something you'll want to practice at home when you're studying for task three. So the bunting or those flags on the, the top of the screen in the image are described as pink and yellow. He's identifying them as being layered. And he also picks out these colors of cyan, which is a turquoise green and a dark red or purple. So look at the number of descriptive details just for the bunting alone, right? So that's fantastic. The more description that you can put in while still maintaining that 60 second time limit, the better. When we go down to the child in the center of our screen, we get the child's emotion. We know that the child is upset. We know that the dog looks like he's about to get a tasty kebab. We also know what the owner is wearing, but that the owner does not look impressed. So his emotions are also described. The girlfriend too, her emotions are described. She seems to be oblivious. When you're oblivious, it just means that you, uh, you don't have a clue what's happening around you. So you can see what a sophisticated word choice that adjective is, right? And then the senior citizens, we understand there are two of them. He's described them as a pair who are out enjoying their day. So you can imagine if you were sitting in a, in a different room from this test taker and you could not see the image he was looking at, even if you closed your eyes and listened carefully to all of these details, you would have a pretty good strong image in your imagination. And again, that's what this task is wanting you to do. It's your ultimate goal. So our, ta or our test taker rather is, is doing that really well. Now his content is organized too. Remember, it's not just the level of details you add in, it's how well you organize those details that is going to give you your score. So you'll notice that our test taker has decided to start with what I would call the big picture. And then he moves in to focus on individuals in the scene. So he starts by describing the flags that cross over the entire fairgrounds. And then he draws our attention to the three food stalls. And this is the main part of the scene. He tells us that the food stalls are at the foreground. So that's that purple phrase you see on your screen. This anchors the scene, tells you where to look for it. And then each person in the scene, you'll notice, sort of leads into the, the following person, like a chain of events. Our speaker is not just hopping all over the image and picking random people. He's organizing his response. So first is the child. And we know how the child's feeling. And the child is upset because of the dog. And once we mention the dog, we move on to the owner. Once the owner is described, we next hear about the girlfriend. And we end the scene with the senior citizens that are walking nearby. So a nicely organized response from, from sort of big picture to small picture, if you will, with the individuals. And the other purple phrases there that are underlined just show a few other conjunctions or transitions that our test taker is using to fully connect his ideas. So again, content is very strong coherence or organization is also very strong. So well done. We know that this test taker's vocabulary is very sophisticated. We've already looked at many specific objects and people that he's described, but these yellow words on the screen sort of represent the sophistication, right? So again, bunting and cyan and smoothing outfit, these are all fantastic vocabulary words. Um, our test taker's even throwing in adverbs. So that word, unfortunately, just gives us an added layer of description. And again, the strong action words like straining at the leash and descriptions like tasty kebab and does not look impressed, seems to be oblivious. So I'm hoping you can see um, sort of some of the skills anyway that are lending its hand to this level 12 analysis. Okay, the last thing of course that test take or rather raters will look at is your task fulfillment. So this speaker does finish his response within the 60 second time limit, so that's great. His tone is very appropriate and the task is complete. It's clear he's looking at a scene and he has described it well enough that we can imagine exactly what it might look like even without seeing the image. So remember a level 12 speaker can precisely communicate complex details. So we've seen lots of evidence of that in this response. This would be what you can call a, a demanding or a non-routine situation, right? It's a new image to you where there are lots of things happening. 
happening. We've also looked at this test taker's ability to weave complex sentences together and to organize them, and lots and lots of context specifically specific vocabulary, a big range. So we never get a repetition all the way through. So in summary, this response achieved a level 12, partly because his rhythm was very fluent. <clears throat> his details were very specific and well organized. The language was also very descriptive too. So I pointed out lots of specific nouns, some adjectives, some very strong action verbs, and even some adverbs. And our task is complete because we can easily picture the scene and the timing is also correct. So that's what a level 12 speaker can achieve, okay? We're going to contrast that now or compare it, I guess, against a second response. And this test taker is going to be answering the exact same question. So he also is looking at the scene to describe some things that are happening and remembering that the person uh, that he would be speaking you cannot see the picture. All right, now a level nine speaker, again, they've got some, some really strong skills already. This is what a level nine performance profile looks like. So if you're speaking at a level nine, it says that I can communicate complex details, feelings and attitudes in familiar and less familiar contexts. I have control of some complex grammar and an adequate professional repertoire of precise and context-specific vocabulary. My mistakes in grammar, word choice, and pronunciation rarely make it hard for people to understand my meaning. So just before you listen to this man's response, I will point out that he too is a native speaker of English. So English is his first language. He's achieved a level nine. Our first test taker received a level 12. And I partly chose these two responses to look at today to really emphasize that even though we might speak English as our first language, it doesn't automatically guarantee a level 12 response, right? So as we listen to this man's response, I really want you to focus in on his dimensions of listenability. Um, he's fluent, you'll see, but there might be a few things that he could improve upon in this dimension as compared to the level 12 speaker that you just heard. Okay, let's listen to this man's response and we'll go from there. Seems to be a food fair that quite a few people are at, families, kids, dogs. There seems to be a smoothie stand with plenty of flavors. Um, there seems to be a curry bowl stand also. Lots of different ethnic foods. Um, seems to be quite a colorful event. There's lots of elderly people and different families walking around, lots of activities happening. It's nicely decorated with lots of decals and banners and flags. There also seems to be some sort of arts and crafts in the background. There's also some kid is buying a smoothie while there's another parent with his daughter at a kebab stand. Okay, again, so listenability is strong overall. Remember, this speaker did earn a level nine. Um, his pronunciation is pretty clear. There's one word that was pronounced a little bit uh, unusually, and that's the word decal. Uh, you'll notice this test taker used the pronunciation decal. Uh, I think he meant decal. So a decal is like a little, almost like a tattoo, but uh, you put it on, it's like a, an image that transfers onto a window pane. So that would be uh, sort of like some of these pictures you see on the glass where the, the food stalls are. But overall, I mean, pronunciation is very strong. His intonation was fluent, but something I noticed was that this man had a few more pauses than our first test taker did. So it slowed things down just a little bit. So although he was able to describe several things happening, you'll notice in a moment when you see his transcript, the transcript is quite a bit shorter than the first test takers. And that indicates that maybe his pauses could have been removed to afford more opportunity to describe the picture. Okay, but again, overall, we didn't have any major interjections or any major problems with the listenability. Okay, so here is that level nine transcript. You'll notice again, our test taker uh, does a, a decent job of introducing the opening of the scene. We know that we're looking at a food fair. 
So again, please do this when you're answering task three, make sure you're giving that overview of the scene. And our speaker also identifies the people, some of the people, we get families, kids and dogs. So there we go. We also have a variety of objects and people mentioned. So this is the orange words. So he certainly introduces the smoothie stand, the curry bowl stand, elderly people and families. He mentions the decals, the banners and the flags, arts and crafts, a kid and a parent with the daughter at the kebab stand. So there's still quite a bit of specific uh, people mentioned, which is good. The organization though is quite weak, right? Did you notice that he jumps around a little bit? So what we'd like you to do is to uh, group your similar ideas in one place within your response. So I'm noticing if you look right here on the screen, the smoothie stand and the curry bowl stand are introduced at the top and he doesn't introduce the kebab stand until the very bottom, for example. Those three things should easily be introduced side by side. And we get sort of a variety of people and objects just kind of randomly thrown into the response, right? So it makes it harder for a listener to follow that when you're jumping around. So his organization is much weaker than the organization we saw in that level 12 response. Now our level nine test taker does give some actions, right? So these are the black underlined phrases. So we know that the elderly people and families are walking around and that the kid is buying a smoothie. But as you can see, we're missing a lot of more specific details. These, these um, descriptions of actions are more of an overview, right? They don't get into a lot of strong action verbs. We don't even have an action described for the parent and the daughter. So we certainly have room to develop those ideas further, for sure, okay? Even with some of his content ideas, they're adequate, which is exactly what a level nine test taker uh, is able to do. But I, there's certainly room for development. So the smoothie stand does have plenty of flavors, but our speaker never identifies what any of those flavors are. So that might have been a nice thing to throw in to really get more specific. Again, we've got activities happening. Well, what activities? Let's be specific there, right? We get, again, some sort of arts and crafts. So if he's going to mention arts and crafts, then perhaps he can give some examples of that. And finally, that uh, the image of the parent and the daughter at the kebab stand. We want to know specifically what they're doing. So are they standing in line? Are they arguing? Are they eating lunch? What specifically are they doing? So there certainly is room for development as far as his content goes. Now, what I noticed when I, I really looked at this transcript is some of the the sentence structure is, is much more simple than what we saw at the level 12. So those red words on the screen represent conjunctions or transitions that connect ideas together. That bottom sentence using the word while is an example of a complex structure, so that's great. But the black underlying sentences are actually sentence fragments. These sentences are not complete. They're missing a, a complete subject and complete verb. So when we're speaking, we still need to speak in complete sentences. So please keep that in mind as you're practicing. So this speaker gave us enough detail and enough examples of sentence structure that's used correctly. But again, you can see that there's room to develop that further here. One last weakness of this response that I hope you picked out as you listened was the repetition. Look at how many times he starts his sentences with these words, there seems, there's lots, there also. So we can, I think we can do a lot better. We can take out the there and we can replace that with a strong subject and a strong verb. And I'm going to show you how to do that very shortly. Okay, but we want to avoid this repetition and create more complex sentence structures in order to get higher than level nine in that, uh, in that area on the dimension. His vocab is adequate. I mean, all those orange uh, words we've already talked about and these yellow highlighted phrases too demonstrate other words that are suitable as you're describing a food fair. So we do get ethnic foods, we do get uh, colorful event and decorated and the backgrounds described. But as you can see, it's just not quite as sophisticated as that level 12. So we know that a level nine performance uh, profile says the speaker can communicate complex details. And we certainly have some examples. We do get the decals and the banners and things like that. There certainly is some complex grammar. So we pointed out a complex sentence structure and so on. And his vocabulary is suitable. It's adequate. Um, 
yeah, we'll leave it at that. That's what a level nine speaker can do. It's adequate, right? So this is why he's achieved a level nine, but this response can certainly be improved. So the very first thing I would do if I had the opportunity to, uh, to redo this, this response would be to improve the coherence or the organization. So we would really want to group all of our similar ideas together. We definitely want more descriptive details. So more actions in particular, we might have room then to talk a, a bit more about some of the other objects, like the dog, for example, he wasn't even mentioned and he's, he's a good part to talk about. The descriptive language is lacking in this response. So we want more adjectives and more action verbs if we can. And always we can add more complex sentence structures in. Finally, we can avoid all of that repetitious, there is and there seems and there also. So I'd like to walk us through this response now and we're going to do a, a revision process. When we revise ideas, we rewrite them to organize both the content to improve upon that and the organization as well as the, um, the answer itself. All right, so what you see on the screen before you is the exact transcript that our test taker gave us. And I've highlighted the, the first sentence in blue there to demonstrate the sentence that I'd like to fix with you first. So remember, this sentence certainly gives us an overview of the scene, so that's good. But he doesn't set it up in a way that indicates he's describing an image to somebody else. So we're going to rewrite the sentence just a little bit. It doesn't take a lot of effort, but we'll rewrite that to improve his task fulfillment. And I'd like to add just a couple of action verbs and some more details for the people. Families, kids, and dogs is a bit plain. So let's try this. So the orange phrase represents the improved version or the revised version. So if he starts by saying, I'm looking at a picture of a food fair that quite a few people are attending. Parents with young children, couples and their dogs. There. So that's improved, right? Versus what we had earlier. So the next thing I'd like to look at is uh, these blue sentences. So again, this represents our test taker's original response. But again, he, he starts off there talking about the smoothie stand and the curry bowl. And then at the bottom, he mentions kebab stand. So what I'd like to do is move the kebab stand detail from the bottom up to the top. So we've got all three of those food stands described together. So let's try this. I'm going to start with a transition. So we'll say in the foreground, right? That anchors our scene. We know where to look in our imagination. In the foreground are three different ethnic food stalls. So now we have, there's a curry bowl stand, a smoothie stand with plenty of flavors and a kebab stand. Okay, so our organization is better, but now we have another weakness to contend with. We've repeated the word stand over and over again. So we want to, uh, we want to show a variety of language to really improve or impress the readers, so to speak. And I think we can take both of these sentences and combine them to make a complex structure. Let's try it like this. In the foreground are three different ethnic food stalls where the vendors are selling spicy curry bowls, fruit flavored smoothies and chicken kebabs there. So now we've got all three food styles organized in the exact same order they appear on the screen from left to right in that image. And I've even added in a couple of adjectives. So the curry bowls are spicy, the smoothies are fruit flavored and I've specified the kebabs are chicken, right? So I'm giving more detail there. So that's a better way to go. More, more description equals uh, an easier way to imagine the scene. So let's continue uh, the organization improvement. At the bottom here, we get another description from our test taker talking about the kid and the parent at the kebab stand. So that's a, a great detail to describe, but we should really be describing it next in our scene, right? We've just finished talking about the three food stalls. So it makes perfect sense to talk about the people at those food stalls next. So let's do this, let's try. A young boy is buying a smoothie and a father is purchasing another kebab for his daughter because she's dropped hers on the pavement in front of a hungry looking dog. Okay, so yet another complex sentence structure using that word because, and we've even found a way to introduce that hungry dog into the scene. That was not mentioned earlier. So we're getting more details here. So we're on our way through this response to a new and improved version of it. Now the next part of the speaker's response really doesn't tell us a lot, to be honest. He starts off by saying it's a colorful event. And I like that phrase 
it just doesn't quite flow here in this location. We just revised the response to talk about the food stands and the people. So let's save the colorful event for later once we talk about the banners and the decals. Um, he's mentioned again the elderly people and families walking around. But if you go back to our opening sentence, we'd already identified the people in the scene. So we don't really add much value by stating that again here. And then finally, our test taker says lots of activities happening. Well, rather than just say there are lots of things happening, let's specify exactly which activities are happening. So we're just going to remove these ideas from the response altogether, and we're going to rewrite it. Um, so let's Let's pick out the elderly people. They were mentioned. So let's start with them and then we'll give an action. So what are they doing? So an elderly couple is approaching the food stalls while a young mother and her son stroll through the grounds. So there's another complex sentence structure. And again, we've added in a description of that mother and her son. They weren't specified or mentioned earlier. So we've got more detail now. Our speaker continues with, it's nicely decorated with lots of decals and banners and flags. I love the fact that he has specified those objects. So decals and banners and flags are a big part of that scene, but we don't have any um, adjectives. We don't have any descriptive language. And remembering back to that image, I remember how colorful they were and they were shaped in little triangles. So let's rewrite this to add in some very nice descriptive language. So let's say decals and banners advertise the food stalls and strings of red, green, purple, and yellow triangular flags cross over the fairgrounds. Now let's add back our phrase. It's a very colorful event. That seems to go better there, right, than it did earlier. So we're almost finished. Our, our speaker's last sentence talks about that uh, arts and crafts project. He starts with there also, and he gets some sort of arts and crafts crafts. It's very vague. It's not a strong conclusion. So I would like to rewrite this sentence and I'm going to start with a subject like a person and get in a nice strong action verb. So let's say families crowd into white peak tents in the background to create arts and crafts projects. So now that we've walked through this entire response and revised the organization and added some content ideas and descriptive language, we have a much improved final copy. And I've included that here for your references. You'll notice that we actually start now um, with the, uh, the organization rather goes from the foreground, like the front of the scene, all the way to the back with the arts and crafts. And it talks about the individual people along the way. So that's a great way to organize it, okay? The last thing I'd like to do with us today is just give you an opportunity to hear that response spoken aloud as you're looking at this picture again. So I'm hoping that you'll see that this new and improved version is, uh, is just more interesting and more organized. So let's take a listen to this final response as it's been revised. I'm looking at a photo of a food fair that quite a few people are attending. Parents with young children, couples and their dogs. In the foreground are three different ethnic food stalls where the vendors are selling spicy curry bowls, fruit flavored smoothies, and chicken kebabs. A young boy is buying a smoothie and a father is purchasing another kebab for his daughter because she's dropped hers on the pavement in front of a hungry looking dog. An elderly couple is approaching the food stalls while a young mother and a son stroll through the grounds. Decals and banners advertise the food stalls while strings of red, green, purple and yellow triangular flags cross over the fairgrounds. It's a very colorful event. Families crowd into white peak tents in the background to create arts and crafts projects. Okay, so I am going to whoops, stop sharing my screen now and return to the big picture here. If you have any questions about, um, about these responses, I can gladly answer them now if I'm able. So I'll throw that back over to Ashwadi, I guess. Hi, Brandy. Thank you for that presentation. I enjoyed it, as always. Um, so yeah, we do have a question here, one of which was asked uh, at the beginning of your presentation. I think this was for, a, for when you were analyzing um, level 12. And the question is, could you identify the complex compound sentences in that uh, speaking response, if ah, there were any? 
I see. You know what? I have to go back to that slide um, to do that. I'm not sure that'd be a good use of time now. Uh, um, hang on a second. If I pull up my slides, are you still seeing me on the screen right now? Yes, Brandy, we okay, are. Perfect. But that's fine. I, yeah, I mean, no I'm just looking at the response very quickly here in the background of my own screen and we'll see. So what you want to do to identify your complex sentence structures, you have to have a very good uh, understanding of how to use subordinating conjunctions. So maybe I'll ask this test taker, if you want to go back yourself and have a look at the transcripts there, look for words like because, while, where, things like that, although. There are about 12 or 13 subordinating conjunctions we use commonly in English to create complex sentences. All right, the other version of conjunctions are what we call coordinating conjunctions. These are your fanboys words. So for, uh, and, nor, but, or, yet, so. When you're using one coordinating conjunction and one subordinating conjunction in the same sentence, you have then created a complex compound sentence structure. So I'll challenge our test takers <laughs> to go back to that transcript later if they so desire and have a look at the different conjunctions used. And you'll see for yourself if indeed there were any complex compound structures. Um, it's not mandatory. Keep this in mind. You don't have to use complex compound structures all the way through to get to that level 12. Um, what our test taker that did earn the 12 did well is all of his sentences were grammatically structured. And he used such a variety of structures there as well that it really boosted the elevation. Yeah, so it's a hard one to answer, but I, I'm hoping that you can go back and have a peek at that at your leisure. Great, thank you for asking that question, Bharat. Um, so we have another question. This is a more generic question. Um, Satyam is asking how, what steps they can take to improve their grammar. To improve your grammar, are you, are you talking about speaking or writing? I guess it doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, I think what I would do first and foremost is identify for yourself uh, what one specific skill you want to focus on first. I mean, grammar encompasses so many different skill sets, right? Um, a big one that I find a lot of test takers have a really hard time with is verb tense. And because we use a verb in every single sentence we speak, it's really important to start there to anchor your scene. So you want to look at what tense I'm, I'm speaking in or writing in, and does my verb choice agree back to the subject? So start with that. Um, there is a variety of online, you can Google anything and find some examples. We do, of course, have some materials in our uh, bookstore that you can look at. We have a CellPip common uh, error book that goes through some of the commonly made errors. Um, but yeah, focus on one skill set at a time, and that's going to be different for each of you, right? So once you get your subjects and verbs down pat, you then might want to move on to these conjunctions that I was just speaking about earlier. So identify the six coordinating conjunctions and practice on using them each correctly. Once you can do that, move on to the subordinating conjunctions and so on and so forth. Um, and by the way, the, the revision process we took today when we improved that level nine response, that you can use that in both writing and speaking as you're studying. So I meant to say, it's clear you would never have an opportunity on a test to go back and think that much about how you could improve your response. But I challenge all of you out there as you're studying at home, you know, record your own responses, listen to them back and type out your transcript, word for word what you're saying. And this is actually going to help you identify what you're already doing very well and what you need to work on. So as far as how do I improve my grammar, see for yourself what grammar points are weak for you. And looking at your own transcripts will help you do that. And then you can start workshopping it through either by yourself or with feedback from a tutor or a teacher if you're able to find somebody near you. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that. And I hope that answered your question. Um, next question is from Dheeraj. Can we use casual language words like yeah, yep, wanna, wanna be, gonna be? And I think we can look at this from the speaking point of view as well as a writing point of view, uh, Brandy. Okay, in your writing, please never use those, uh, those I can't even call them contractions. So words like gonna and wanna are slang. So we don't ever want to use those in writing because they're just not professional, even in a day-to-day -day, uh, language test like the Celtic, okay? So not ever in writing. In speaking, I think I always jokingly say English speakers are lazy. We tend to blend a lot of our sounds together and make it easy for ourselves. So instead of saying I am, we say I'm, right? It's a lot faster. So sometimes as we're speaking, instead of saying going to, we shorten that to gonna. If you're speaking to a close family friend or something like 
like that, it might be mildly acceptable. I think because this is a language proficiency test, I would try very hard to use the full word. So instead of gonna, I would say I'm going to, just to make sure that the, the readers that are listening to me understand that I know how to phrase those words properly, right? In your own day-to-day -day speaking with your friends and your family out in, in the world, it's perfectly fine to use words like gonna. But I think on a test, I would shy away from those just in case the raters are unclear whether you actually have the vocabulary or not. Always err on the side of caution, right? When you're doing a test. Yeah, so use contractions. I'm is okay, but let's get that real word out going too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I hope that answered your question, Dheeraj. Okay, we have, I thought we, oh yeah, we have another question from Kathy Brooks. Um, she's asking, what is the best way to conclude a response in the speaking test? Ah, okay, this might depend a little bit on the task that you're being asked, of course, because each question on the speaking test uh, has a different focus. I think uh, in the ones we saw today, both of the gentlemen had their own method of organization. So in that level nine response, we started with, uh, I think it was the food stalls, and we ended at the back with the white peaked tent. So it was clear we, we concluded everything we needed to speak about. Um, sometimes you might want to offer just if you have time, and it always depends on time, right? If you've got five seconds to fill, if that were my real response, that revised version in level nine, I might have just added in, you know, everyone is having an amazing time at the fair or something like that. It just gives a general statement to kind of wrap up the entire scene. All right. So that's one way to do it. it. It does depend on your time, but you always have to think about the main points you, you made. And the concluding statement generally summarizes the main key point. In this task three, it would be the people and the place, right? Okay, great. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I think that is all we have for your questions uh, from our comments below. I will obviously also give you questions that we get from our communications account or later, and then we can address it in the next episode. But for now, thank you so much for joining us, Brandy. Okay, thanks for having me. We'll see you another time. Bye. Bye. Okay, guys, uh, I'm, hope I'm hoping you found that video useful. Again, if you have any questions that Brandy was not able to answer now, please ask them below and we will address them in the next episode, um, so on and so forth. But for now, let's go to our news updates. As of now, we resume testing in quite a few places. Um, you could book your tests in UAE, Hong Kong, Philippines, and obviously Canada. Um, within Canada, we resume testing in BC, Manitoba, Yukon, and Newfoundland. So if, if I did not mention your country uh, or your province, there is a possibility that you can still register for your test, but there are chances that you will be notified about cancellations or transfers. So please go ahead and check uh, at selfweb.ca if you can book for your book your test at the moment. But I have to let you know that these things are changing constantly and every day. So there are chances that we might have to cancel or transfer your test. I'm getting uh, a few queries on communications at Paragon uh, testing.ca requesting that we transfer your test dates. So I wanted to let you know that yes, we can transfer your test dates, but you can also do that for free um, through your account on our website. So um, you just have to go to your account and reschedule your test for the day, date and time you want. Again, this is completely free. Um, I will link the steps um, for the transfer below uh, in our description below, but you will have to scroll a little bit to find out the actual instructions. Um, and if you want to cancel your test instead, you'll have to email uh, and call our customer support team and they will be able to help you out. So for those of you testing this week, firstly, I wish you all the best, uh, but please note that masks are now mandatory. Uh, so bring a surgical mask or a cloth face covering with you. You will have to wear this for the entirety of your test, including the speaking test. So if you are worried about how this works, you can find that answer to one of our previous videos. I think this is uh, episode 14. Uh, it's called Latest Immigration Updates. And our manager, our test center operations manager, Michelle, um, talks about the testing and um, research that went into making sure that your voice is audible through masks. 
if you're curious about understanding more about your scores, uh, we have a score comparison chart now on our website. Um, I will also link that in the description below. Um, you can understand what each level means, um, read sample answers, and learn about parameters our readers use to calculate your score. Uh, it's a handy feature for you all, so please check it out. Oh, one thing I wanted to let you know is that you can now send in your scores uh, digitally to the IRCC or any other institution that you're planning to send your scores to. So you do not have to wait for it to come by post. Um, you can just send them as soon as you get them in four or five days. So, uh, and one more thing, for those of you who are applying for Canadian citizenship, please check out our videos from last week. We focused on self with LS and citizenship for the entirety of, la of last week. And we also played a trivia game um, for you to see what a Canadian knowledge test looks like during your citizenship application. So please check that out. And this game uh, was in a way that our viewers could participate with us. So if you're interested in playing such games with us, do let us know and we will make sure we incorporate that. Um, and lastly, Selpip Accelerate is now 25% off. If you're looking for resources for your preparation, uh, Selpip Accelerate is a great resource uh, and you can find the link to our prep products in the description below as well. So please go ahead and access this 25% off when it's still available. That's it for our news updates. Uh, but this Friday, we're talking all about masks. We understand that a few of you are finding it hard to purchase masks because they're out of stock in many places. So if you're interested in finding out how to make, make a mask at home, um, you can join us this Friday. We're also going to be sharing tips on how to get used to wearing a mask for three hours, uh, keeping your mask clean and more. So again, this is on June 12 at 9.30 a.m. PST. Please join us. Um, as always, you can send in your questions to us in the comments below, but you can also send it to us at communications at paragontesting.ca. Um, um, you can also use any of our social media accounts. Our Facebook and Instagram is always updated with the latest news. And I also make sure that I address everybody's direct messages. So please engage with us. You can also follow us and make, be up to date on all the information about the self-help test. Um, but until then, um, I thank you for being here. This series was made for you all. So please share this video with anybody else you think might find it useful. And you can also suggest any new information or any new videos that you might want us to make. But until this Friday, I will see you and I hope you wash your hands. Bye.